Hey there, folks. Welcome to another episode of the Cracked Podcast, the podcast all about why being alive is more interesting than people think it is. My name is Alex Schmidt, and I'm the head of podcasting here at Cracked. I'm also known as Schmitty the Clam, and I am also, also passing you right along to our latest episode of the show. It's a self-explanatory topic. It's one of my favorite Cracked things, and let's get you right into it. So please sit back or sit forward in like anticipation of what the topic might even be. You don't even know what this show is yet. How about that? Either way, enjoy this episode of the Cracked Podcast with our fantastic live UCB Sunset panel of Dan Hopper, Molly Lambert, and Danny Fernandez, plus audience member friends. I'll be back after we wrap up. Talk to you then. So glad to have you here. So glad to have an amazing panel here. And the thing we're talking about today is the art of acting. And specifically when people super were not doing it. The topic is amazing performances from actors who were not acting. Like what you're seeing happen to them on screen or their reaction or what's going on is is very real. There's a lot to it. Um, quick example of it uh, before we get way, way into it. I don't know who, if you know the movie Alien, 1979, Ridley Scott. Uh, really, really great. A few laughs from the aliens in the room. And one of the most famous things in that movie, like it's so famous, Spaceballs does a bit about it, is that there's a chest burster, right? Like there's John Hurt on a space gurney. I don't know what it is. And then suddenly, oh, an alien bursts out of his chest. And isn't that terrifying? And when you're seeing the other crew members uh, react to this, they are really terrified. They did not know what was going to happen. They didn't know it was going to be a whole special effect. All that was there in the script was, the thing emerges. <laughs> and that's it. And that's all they knew. And they were like really built up the surprise, too, because what the crew did is they didn't just surprise them with it all at once. They did a first take that was a trick. Uh, the trick was they like gathered everybody and then they were like, okay, here's the effect. And it was like just a little blood came out, like a little burble, and that was it. And so they said, okay, clearly my brain thinks this is all that's gonna happen. And then the next take, they sprang this out of it and actress Veronica Cartwright passed out. She <laughs> full on collapsed and they could not finish the scene that day. They had to wait a whole nother day. Uh, apparently Yafet Kato was confident he was going to have a heart attack and he had to go back to his trailer and like chill out, you know? And so what's on screen, I, I think it's exciting to know that that's so real. Also terrifying, also exciting, because that's life, isn't it great? And that's kind of the show. That's what we're gonna talk about today. There's also gonna be a part toward the end, because you see there's like a magic microphone over there. That's where if you know any stories along those lines does not have to be xenomorph specific, uh, you can share that with us later, because you might know some amazing Hollywood uh, behind the scenes thing that we don't, and I think that could be neat. Um, but in the meantime, we have an amazing panel to talk about it. Are you ready for the panel? Are you excited about it? Would you signal it with your hands and your whooping? Yeah. I am so glad to be joined by cracked editor and writer and more. You've also seen him everywhere from College Humor to Best Week Ever, Dan Hopper, guys. Give it up for Dan Hopper. Hey. Hi, everyone. That's his voice, person at home. I always like to do that. Um, <laughs> we are also joined by, you know her from Grantland, from all over the internet, and her podcast, Night Call. Uh, please welcome Molly Lambert. Molly Lambert. <laughs> hey, everybody. Yeah, that's her voice, folks at home. And uh, very excited to uh, have from her new podcast, Nerdificent, and many more things, Geek and Sundry, all over the internet. Please welcome Danny Fernandez. Danny Fernandez. Danny, when, when we'd been prepping this, you'd picked out one story from Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Yes. Which is, uh, it's pretty amazing just how it works. Go ahead. Yeah, so the kids in Willy Wonka didn't know Willy Wonka. Like, they didn't, they weren't aware, <laughs> they had never met Gene Wilder. Yeah. So the first time they met him was at that entrance scene where he does the fall which I love him, but I think that he really was like, like really proud of himself for doing it. I mean, he brought it up in multiple interviews that I read. He was like, yeah, in the fall, my idea. Um, so they didn't know, so their reactions were real. 
their reactions in most of the film were real. Like they didn't even, they gave them a script. Like they gave them their lines, but nobody else's. Which if you're an actor, that is not how acting works. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's so like, they had no idea. <laughs> just like a list? Like, these are things you'll say. Yeah, like it's, <laughs> yeah, but they have nothing to go off. So like, oh, another one that was so sad is the end, like the office scene with Charlie. He had no idea that Gene Wilder was going to yell at him. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so man. he's like an 11-year-old boy, and Gene was like, I really wanted to tell him because we were friends at that point. <laughs> and so he just <laughs> ends up screaming at this little kid who had no idea. And that's because children can't act. So, <laughs> uh, so they're child actors in quotes. It's more just little human beings reacting to people yelling at them. <laughs> did they, were they shooting for genuine reactions or did they just not know how movies worked? <laughs> they're just like... Yeah. Right, like they were given a budget on a camera by a Willy Wonka type figure, and then they yeah. were just doing stuff. Yeah. Also, I mean, they really didn't let them know. I want to drive this home. The scene where he's in the Wonka, the boat, or I forgot the name of it. It's like, is it like a tunnel? A Wonka. And like, yeah, the yeah. tunnel with the chocolate and the boat that yeah. they're in. Anyways, so Willy Wonka gets progressively crazier and crazier, and then he starts screaming that they're all going to die. The children had no idea. <laughs> They had no idea. In fact, they interviewed them later because this was on the DVD commentary, the adult now adults who are traumatized, and they were essentially like, we we thought he was on drugs. <laughs> like we they were like, we we really thought like when he started screaming that we were gonna die, we thought he was steering it and that we were yeah, so they were <laughs> we haven't seen them work since. So Yeah. Well, and also, I feel like that's a fair assumption on their part that he was on drugs, because in the 60s and 70s, right. I yeah. believe everyone was on drugs. And his name was Gene Wilder. <laughs> so, yeah, but it was, uh, it was they weren't acting. When is it? So there was also, like, wonder when they saw just a cool room, too, right? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, they hadn't, um, they never took him into the set, so they were excited. You know, they got all of their actual... Uh, reactions to seeing the inside of his factory, yeah. uh, which was basically like blown up balloons and clay, like, you know, like wax figures and stuff. But, um, and like that chocolate river that did not look chocolate at all. <laughs> yeah, it just looked like a bunch of sewage. I did want to say that in my research, I saw that Gene Wilder, they asked him how he felt about the new Willy Wonka with Johnny Depp. Oh, they which, did? Which, why do you do that? Like, don't... Don't act, like when they asked Harrison Ford about Solo, or if he was excited about Solo, and he said no. <laughs> <laughs> Harrison Ford hasn't been excited about anything in That's 45 true. years. <laughs> like. But yeah, so they asked Gene Wilder how he felt, and he was he was like, you know, I liked Johnny Depp, but he actually said that he not only was did he not like Tim Burton, but he was insulted by most of his films. So, like, not even the ones that he remade of his. Like, he's insulted in general by Tim Burton's existence. That's amazing. Let's look at another. This is kind of of that era. Uh, Conan the Barbarian. Molly, you, you picked out this story as we were uh, prepping this about how, uh, you know, it's a big action film. So surely there were stunt uh, crew or something like that, right? Well, I think Arnold's whole thing was that he did his own stunts because he was like a real life strong man. But yeah. the story was about how he got chased by wild dogs for the movie. And that there's like a scene where these wild dogs chase Conan. And they were like, that was just, he was really running from those dogs. <laughs> <laughs> and they almost mauled him. And it was terrible. <laughs> but after listening to your stories, too, I, I feel like a lot of this is dependent on getting a first take of things. Yeah. To get that reaction shot. Because if you don't get it in the first take when they're genuinely... Yeah. surprised then or actual actors <laughs> like just <hire. laughs> that's what we nah. do we're trained to react to things well arnold nah. schwarzenegger definitely seems like somebody who they were like we'll just bring him to hollywood and put him in dangerous situations <laughs> and pay him just for that what about your turbo man doll <laughs> yeah i love that it's feats of strength Right. He's large enough. Surely he can tolerate. I mean, he dogs. outran them. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't wrong. That's a good point. Yeah. A lot of these things, too, you're like, well, now that would be CGI. But in right. that time, the 80s, you just had to have real wild dogs chase your lead actor yeah. to make sure that it seemed authentic. 
I, I like the idea that if they didn't get it on the first take, they like lamely try to recapture the magic. Yeah. And they're like, uh, okay, we're not going to chase you with dogs this time. They're like, just kidding. And they do it again. <laughs> like, and it's like, just keep doing it. Like, okay, take five. We're not really going to do it. When I think about the past in general, I feel like equipment was very, very faulty. You know, it's so like when we're talking about, oh, they need to nail the first take. Like, not only is this pressure on the actors and the director and everything, but like, what about the film loading dude or whoever hands? Because <laughs> like, if they screw it up when it was the shot at it, that's it. The movie's done, or else you hire actors. Boring. You know, like, like what do you do? <laughs> I wouldn't want to be on any of those crews. That's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> film back then was printed on like dense like gold and it's like so expensive to do another take like and there's a uh, and there's other elements to the conan shenanigans too right like there it seems like every actor was in physical danger in the entire movie yeah it seemed like maybe they didn't have the biggest special effects budget or they did but they spent it all on special effects and not on like a safety crew <laughs> which a lot of these anecdotes that we read for this it seemed like they were things that you were like, wow, I can't believe it's legal to do that as long as you're making a movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can really do anything as long as it's for a movie. It's what I right. found out from reading these stories. And it's, it's like kind of recent, too. It's not, you know, it's not like, oh, in 1910 when they started making movies, they were... Well, that was probably even stuff. more dangerous. Yeah, but it's like, yeah. you know, this is the 80s. It's not, you know, people had, you know, awareness that you don't want your actor to get ripped apart by wild dogs. Well, that's what gives him sued. the motivation to really run yeah. fast. <laughs> I also feel like it, lo like it, maybe it didn't look better, but it was a lot more grounded because now when I watch all these superhero, like CGI films, I'm like, oh, yeah, there's, it's so fake. Like, can't you, how is it 2018? You know, it looks like a video game. It should look real. That's what I'm saying. I want to, am I, are we allowed to cuss on this? Yeah, go for it. I want to fuck robots. <laughs> 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 that had nothing to do with anything. Yeah, that, that, that wasn't the, <laughs> that, that cuss Anytime blew me away. That was great. I mentioned that it's 2018, I'm like, I should be able to by now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'll just get to the I'll just get to the point that we were all leading towards. Yeah. Let's stop beating around the bush. Yeah. Anyways, what I was going to say, the robots back then. Oh, this this ties in because Arnold Schwarzenegger was a robot. I feel like those action scenes, go. those action scenes were a lot more believable. Yeah. Yeah. I like what you've introduced, which is that maybe Schwarzenegger really just is a Terminator, and that's why no one was afraid See? to kill him because they were like, we'll just send him to the repair shop. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be fine, and then Danny can make out with him. Oh yes, <laughs> he can pick me up. That's my goal. He can pick you up, You're and then like a, a lot car. About me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well, I date. Can he lift me? Y'all know what I'm talking you're, about. I feel like you're so right about CGI, though, because it's like they really haven't improved on the original Jurassic Park since no. it came out. And that yeah. was only yeah. worked because it was like a combination of practical effects and CGI. And yeah, now right it's on. all just like 100% CGI. And you can tell that they don't have real fear in their eyes when they're running <laughs> from the dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. You know, that's you the difference. send some wild dogs after <laughs> Channing know, Tatum. You just or unzip the dinosaur and a bunch of dogs <laughs> run out. <laughs> <laughs> Can you believe this T-Rex? And it's just this shifty lump of dogs. It just like that's clearly stop. It like runs, stops for 15 seconds to smell. Like run, <laughs> stop. <laughs> Yeah, a sack of dogs is scary in its own way. <laughs> You're like, what's it going to do? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We brought up uh, Arnold and being a Terminator and stuff, and, and Dan, you'd picked out the second Terminator film. Someone was more badass than him. Well, apparently, uh, Terminator 2, one of the best movies of all time, first rated R movie I saw in the theaters. That, st that stays with you. Sick. Um, did you say same? I said sick. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sick. You're still impressed today when people see rated R movies. <laughs> it's just Alex. What? <laughs> it's just like, oh, hell yeah, you saw Can you Call Me By Your Name? <laughs> Fuck yeah, man. It's like, just, it's like, yeah, I'm like in our, my 30s, I can just do that. Um, <laughs> uh, so, no, apparently the scene in Terminator 2 where uh, Linda Hamilton, she's pretending to be comatose to get out of the mental hospital and this orderly, like, like licks her face, and then when she's escaping, she breaks off a mop handle and just beats the shit out of this guy. Apparently, 
She just did that. <laughs> they, they, they were like, chore- they were fight choreographing all these things where it was like, you know, her doing it and him reacting. And they just, like all these things uh, that we were just talking about, claimed they couldn't get a genuine enough reaction and that the shots looked staged and they looked fake. And so he was like, we're just going to have him, we're just going to have her like do it for real. And she just wailed on this orderly <laughs> who like, you know, so that scene where she runs, like the most violent scene in Terminator 2 is actually the part where she runs out and just nails the guy in the back of the, li- it's like, oh, man. she's really doing that to some poor actor who already is cast as like molesty, like, <laughs> <laughs> like orderly guy. Because he kind of <laughs> looks like it, and you feel, you know, it's like he's so creepy looking, yeah. and then also gets the shit beat out of him for real in the movie Dang. for this little bit part. Like, I feel like they could have used like somebody that was doing time, like for yeah. you know, like some dog abuser, and just like oh, put yeah. him in. I don't know. That's my resolve for the prison crisis we currently. Have. <laughs> what? I, like, just animal abusers, like put them as extras that are being. <laughs> Where a card at the end, like no animals were harmed, and also every human who got harmed was like real mean. Serving time. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> Did you put the uh, real mean disclaimer at the end of the movie, like right out next to like the dates? It's yeah, the law. But it's just funny though, because Terminator Two is so ahead of its time in special effects, like the the visual effects of the T-1000 walking through bars and he like morphs through it. And then there's the part where, you know, at the end, Arnold, half of his face is off and he has like a mechanical eye and he cuts his arm off and shows his mechanical arm to his creator. All of that, they managed to figure out how to make it work practically. But they're like, (laughs) I think you're really gonna have to beat the shit out of this guy. (laughs) Like That we can't, we just can't figure out how to get a real shot of that. I just, you know, we tried. The, the robot arm thing, easy. We figured that out with effects. But, uh, you know, people aren't going to buy it if, <laughs> if it's fight choreography. This also <laughs> just adds to the idea that Arnold is unkillable. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because, like, they, they did it for real with him, but we don't yeah. know because they just... Yeah. Boop, 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 boop. Yeah. Him yeah. cutting his arm off was real also. <laughs> <laughs> he just cuts the sleeve of skin off to show his robot hand. That, was, that part was also real, so it got less attention. Right. Yeah. Did you get it? Like, just, like, <laughs> chill. Uh, you know what are else you sure we shouldn't get one for safety? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say what else is Very real is her freaking arms. Holy hell. Hell yeah. She's yeah. like my gym goal. She's on my inspiration board. Like I literally <laughs> have sent pictures to my trainer of her arms. She looks like she, you know those uh, YouTube videos of the women that can like squish a watermelon with their thighs? <laughs> I do not. Let me... <laughs> Let me open this world for you. <laughs> no wonder you're excited by R-rated movies. Yeah. You guys riff for a while. I just, uh, yeah. um, no, go up. No, I was going to say, she, that's her. She's the watermelon oh, yeah. squisher. Isn't there a thing with it where she also learned to pick locks for the movie? Because like, she did like all this crazy physical training and then beat up a guy. But it seems like she really, really committed to... It's also crazy because she was married to the director at the time. So like I imagine they were just strategizing about it all day, every day. Just like oh, yeah. Going to the gym and coming up with weird obstacle courses for her to do. <laughs> tough mutters. <laughs> <laughs> doing a tough mud every single day. Like, it'll show up on screen. Like, all right. It did. Yeah, I guess it kind of did. I mean, I'm, I, they, they we're making fun of all these movies like for this weird process, but these are all really good movies. They're all really good remember, movies. They right? turned out really good. This could never possibly go wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they yeah. should have done all the things. Yeah, that movie would have been crap if the fight, the fight, her beating the guy was slightly less believable or if she couldn't actually pick locks. That definitely showed up. <laughs> you definitely could tell in this... I walked out of the theater. I was like, I really believe that she could pick locks. <laughs> it's, like, it's like the pool quote on the poster. <laughs> right. like, Riveting. Could really pick locks. It's like <laughs> We have been speaking of very, very good movies. And Danny picked out the oh, movie no. Paperboy. It's from 2012, directed yeah. by Lee Daniels. And uh, it's uh, Nicole Kidman and Zac Efron. Oh, what a romantic time they must have had. I don't think it was good. I don't know. Actually, I take that back. Like, I think when they first, I forgot what film festival they showed it at, but I guess it got a 16-minute standing ovation, which, like, who timed that? (laughs) Who was, like, exactly 16 minutes? But at another festival, it was booed. 
So I really don't know how <laughs> critics feel about it. What I do know is that there's a scene where Zac Efron gets stung by a bunch of jellyfish and Nicole Kidman has to pee on him and she does. She urinates yeah. on him. But the thing about it is, is that they didn't really even show anything. Like there wasn't a purpose for her to pee. Like it just shows the pee stream. Like right. give me the full vag. Like give me something. <laughs> if you're gonna actually pee right. on Zac Efron, like rub it in there a little bit. Like you couldn't, <laughs> I didn't know that it was her really peeing. And you should right, you know. can't tell. Yeah, or else why are you peeing on Zac Efron? <laughs> they could have just taken like a teapot and you know, and I was on his chest. I don't know. She, her quote was <laughs> something about like she really trusted Zach and he trusted her, which that's such a weird, I guess you do have to have trust to pee on someone. It's yeah. weird that she said yeah. she trusted him. It was like, were you expecting him to like shove you? <laughs> 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 like where, where is the trust coming on his end? He's literally laying there with his eyes closed while you piss on him. <laughs> <laughs> he like tricks you into doing it to somebody else and then he's over there yeah. like ha <laughs> like wait maybe like, because it's a sexual thing i don't know like yeah maybe that's why <laughs> it was like oh i trusted but it was um through her bathing suit like even then it was like i don't understand the purpose did you watch the paper boy for this no <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry i watched the clip which you can watch in like french or something on youtube or or else yeah, it's yeah. um that's or else I've you can't it. watch it so it's like kind of like has a remix to it a little bit. <laughs> you know how they sometimes have to like remix the sound and whatnot? Oh, they like speed why? it up a little bit so it gets past the YouTube copyright thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I watched her, a remixed version of her pissing on him. <laughs> how many times had it been watched? Probably a lot. Actually, not as many as you would think. Yeah, but I feel like that's because it like you would have to type in something weird. Whoever your editors are that found it, you have to like yeah, type in yeah. something weird to find it. Because I feel like all of the high school musical fan base would have found it by now. <laughs> but they actually probably own it at home on DVD. So because also like I I have never acted in a movie. You know, but I, I, it seems like it's like going to camp or something. And then like you get way, way into it and there's like a team spirit to like, are, are a lot of these just, I feel like it's just a product of the whole cast being like, well, we're a team, we're going to do it. And then it leads to like, okay, Nicole, obviously we have the fake urine bottle. And she's like, no, we're a team, right? Like, yeah, isn't that, I'm I feel an like, actress. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, one thing that I noticed is he actually got stung on his face. Yes. And so she didn't, I mean, come on. If you're an actress, you would have pissed on his face, right? <laughs> Maybe, so how much did they actually trust each other? Not enough. Oh, yeah. 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 Also, it doesn't really cure jellyfish things, right? Yeah, yeah, it doesn't. I guess that's a myth. Yeah, it's like just a thing. Don't go do that, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it like doesn't really work. It Unless just... you and your partner trust each other. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> also, I love Nicole Kidman. If she ever listens to this, I'm, I'm, I'm just making fun of this scene, no, not she's your just, career I think in general. We admire her dedication to being method. Yeah, that's true. Like she had sex with Tom Cruise for Eyes Wide Shut. Yeah, and for like seven years. <laughs> yeah, that was all method to get that performance in that movie, which is great. Great movie. Yeah, sticking with it. Um, <laughs> We also, uh, let's look at, yeah, this sort of relates. Um, so The Exorcist, uh, I feel like most people have seen it, way into it. So there's the, I guess, most famous thing in The Exorcist, other than her head spinning a lot, is vomiting all over the people in the room, you know? Because that's, that's what you pay the ticket for. And uh, so they had the actor playing Father Damien, and they were like, okay, so obviously she's going to vomit on you, because uh, that's how it's written. And he said, great, not the face, right? And they're not going to. And they're like, yeah, yeah, totally in the chest. And then the crew, like, secretly adjusted the <laughs> vomit firer. So that take is him being completely shocked that he's getting vomit all over his face. He had no idea that was going to happen to him. And that's why he looks so upset, and I've, that's why I've seen that movie, <laughs> probably, because it's a big hit. I like how preoccupied you are with getting your money's worth for, like, yeah. you know, well, if it doesn't have, like, the, the gotta prove that R rating with the scene where somebody <laughs> gets vomited on in the face. Yeah, because I snuck out of the house to, <laughs> like, under my parents' watch fly. That, I'm upset for him, because that's, like, in porn, that's such a violation. Like, if you yeah. say you're going to do it on the chest, you don't do it on the face. Like, there, okay, that, so I'm angry <laughs> for him. 
vomit. You're, you're talking about vomit, right? Yeah, vomit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's no, there's no Kidman Efron situation. There's no trust. Because um, also the director was William Friedkin, and there's a behind-the-scenes documentary about the movie called The Fear of God. And apparently William Friedkin kept several loaded guns around, like just on set. For filmmaking? No. So he could just fire them every once in a while <laughs> to keep the crew like freaked out and keep the actors like really, really tense. So then when they're in scenes, it's like, oh, look how tense they are about the possessed kid. <laughs> yeah, it seems like some people take advantage of the filmmaking process to just like have a cult. <laughs> Where everyone yeah. has to do what you say, and then they all like end up liking it because you're in a cult <laughs> together. Fun question: Should all directors uh, be in jail? Should they all? Yeah. <laughs> should we put all of them in prison? I'm, I'm yay uh, on that. I think I'm, a I'm hard like yay. no, but I can name like ten. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is that thing where like everybody's like, oh, I just want to commit to this thing, and then directors are like, I just have to get the shot, and then people are like, I watch films and I think, oh, they're gonna to really try but no they are like trying like they're really going for it that's what i imagine it was like working with jared leto on like suicide squad like you never knew when like a used condom was gonna get chucked at you <laughs> <laughs> you like go to craft services you're like eating spaghetti it's just a bunch of like shoestrings or something he was yeah. so it was funny that he was like no it's part of the process i'm like no you're just a dick <laughs> That's why that movie's so good. Right. See, the theory it it holds an up. Oscar, yeah. Oscar winning Suicide Squad. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't it win for like makeup or something? Was that, what did it win Probably. for? Probably. Best movie of all time. Because <laughs> yeah. this is just like a side thing. But one time I, my friend got a free poster of The Wolfman, like the Benicio Del Toro, The Wolfman. And we just had it up in our apartment. And then The Wolfman was up for one Oscar for makeup. And we made that what we were watching for. It was the, it's the best way to watch the Oscars. If you just pick one movie to win one really random thing, it's great. Do Did it, it win? Time. It won. What? And then, then what I did is I ran and I printed a little sign that was like one Oscar winning film and attached it to the poster. Yes. <laughs> the value of the poster through the roof yeah, yeah. after it won. It's yeah. cool to be a fan of a movie where you know that you're the only person who's a fan of it. Well, I, I haven't seen it. Uh, <laughs> we just had the poster. Uh, and, I, I got, and I treated it like sports at the Oscars. That was what I did with it. Um, it's speak. never too late. <laughs> Later. Actually, it is. They don't have any copies yeah. of The Wolfman anymore. <laughs> that movie's been deleted. Yeah. Destroyed them all because everyone who saw it turned into a wolfman. <laughs> it's too powerful. Yeah. A wolf yeah. person. <laughs> it's a wolf person. Let's, uh, let's talk horror because we've got, uh, Danny brought up Silence of the Lambs. And uh, that, I guess it's horror thriller, a lot of things. Uh, and it's also uh, just really, really nuts behind the scenes. Yeah, there's a couple really disturbing uh, things about the behind the scenes of Silence of the Lambs, which, again, I, I love this movie, but it, the, the reading about the process made me like it a little bit less. Yeah. Uh, well, the, the first part is, this is actually a little funny, that I guess they were, they were having trouble getting like the right tone between uh, Jodie Foster and Anthony Hopkins and so, you know, he, she wasn't intimidated enough by him. She wasn't, like, frustrated enough, according to, you know, the director, the people on set. And so he started actually making fun of her and started criticizing her West Virginia accent <laughs> and saying, like, how crappy it was. And, of course, Jodie Foster being, like, super serious actress who would probably dialect coached for months to do that. Like, that was, like, the thing that, like, really cut her and, like, got yeah. them, like, butting heads like within the scenes which is kind of a little bit funny to just imagine like anthony hopkins in character like mildly insulting people <laughs> oh. like <laughs> like nice handbag clarice <laughs> like <laughs> uh brown much <laughs> like just like in character like just <laughs> dissing people's like clothes or whatever but the other part that i really hated and uh this I, again probably should be illegal to the scott glenn the actor who played uh clarice's supervisor for the fbi they wanted him to like ha really get into like veteran fbi police experience mindset to so he like hates you know i guess so he hates buffalo bill mo enough and it shows up on screen or whatever but they made him watch 
a bunch of old, like, horrifying footage of, like, you know, murder scenes, grisly murder scenes, and made him listen to a tape of, like, a girl getting tortured by, like, sick murderers and, like, to get, like, a performance out of him. And he's in, like, what, five or six scenes in the movie? Yeah. And he's, like, a side character. <laughs> and he said, it, he said it, like, scarred him for life. And he was, like, couldn't, like, sleep after that. See, it's a bring down, like, <laughs> well, brought down the whole show, but it's Did you like, call the Buffalo Bill a side character? <laughs> no, the FBI. Oh, the FBI, FBI guy. guy. He, yeah, yeah. wow, yeah, that's a lot of yeah, work it's like, for... Yeah. yeah, we need to, like, ruin his actual life <laughs> to get, like, the seventh build character's performance to be a little bit better. Like, and probably didn't, like... You yeah, know. he's not a memorable character. Well, also, with, I think there's also one other thing with this movie, too, which is, I feel like it's kind of nice, right? Because it's, like, Buffalo Bill and the victim in the film, like, they were actually awesome friends in real life. Like, they really, really got along behind the scenes. Yeah, so there's a... There's a Positive like, takeaway. Hey, <laughs> Lives yeah. were ruined. Friendships were made. <laughs> well, give and take. <laughs> the one guy couldn't sleep forever, but Buffalo Bill and the pit lady, really, they, they get brunch together. It's great. They make lotion jokes all the time. It's fun. It's fun. It's great. Well, and that actually leads us right into The Blair Witch Project. It's still a good movie. Yeah. I had totally forgotten how much I knew about the backstory of it. I was like, it all came back to me reading all that stuff about how they just gave them camcorders and then kind of set them on a camping trip in the woods and then put out the scares for them, basically. What do you mean put out the scares? Like, like they were like, like okay, you're camping oh, and yeah. just camp wherever. And then they were like shadowing them while they camped. And then while they <laughs> slept, they'd put up like a scary spoon doll on a tree. So oh, yeah, yeah. Then they wake up and be like, where did this come from? And like, I guess they knew it was the film crew, but they also like didn't see the film crew the whole time they were filming. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like they like tried to create the, well, it sounds intuitive, like tried to create what was the fictional plot. They just actually tried to scare some people in the woods <laughs> and yeah, then document and it. Yeah, then they presented it as a fake documentary at first when they put it out. They mm -hmm. marketed it as like, we just found this. Yeah. Found it in the woods. Like, you find weird videotapes sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> we just put it on, and it was this. And now it's in theaters. Uh, and it worked on me. I was like, ooh, that's scary. I'm going to go yeah, see it. Yeah, it just randomly is formatted for a big screen. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> These kids are really well mic'd. <laughs> like, like, like. Yeah, I, I do think me in 1999 thought that how movies worked is just someone has a VHS tape and they put it in a thing and then that's theaters. Like, yeah. <laughs> really, I probably bought it. Yeah. Every time it cuts, they go, mm, with the camera real fast. <laughs> like. I remember it made everyone throw up. At least that were all the stories that I would hear like on the radio. Um, it'd be like, yeah. Blair Witch open this weekend and like 40 people threw up. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't necessarily like the actual Blair Witch stuff, but it was the shaky cam, like the movement. <laughs> oh. That's oh. what made people throw up. <laughs> They're just oh, yeah. nauseous. Blair Witch also came out in those like sort of the early years of the internet. Yeah, when, they like, had a good website. You couldn't just spoil anything immediately if you wanted to. You know, it was like... Dial up. There were six websites, like <laughs> you know. And I haven't seen Blair Witch's website. Was it like? Is it like the Space Jam era, where the Space Jam website is just a couple of toggles? Yeah, it was it. like an Angel Fire that's, type yeah, website for that's sure. Adorable. It had a little like it was like the little <laughs> stick man, and you like click on it to read about like the legend of the Blair Witch because they don't really go into the. There's no backstory for the Blair Witch. <laughs> Yeah, She's yeah. the fourth character. Dare ye sign the witch's <laughs> guest book. <laughs> like old internet jokes. I don't know. <laughs> Mentioning the Bourne movies reminds me of um, like Daniel Craig, James Bond. Because I feel like, especially Casino Royale, that's like super what they were doing. And those movies have like crushed Daniel Craig. He's had a very, very hard time of like before he did Spectre, he was doing an interview on like a lighthearted talk show and they were like, oh, you get a banged up in the shoot? Ha 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 ha. And he was like, I've had one shoulder completely reconstructed. I've had both knees completely, <laughs> completely surgeried on. And it's, it seems like it's basically, it's like he joined the NFL, except he's James Bond. Because like, the stunts are that intense. Is that just an inevitable thing that happens or is it like poor filmmaking? Like I actually wonder that. 
It, I, at this point, maybe it's inevitable because it, it's that thing that we keep, maybe we keep coming back to of like, they want to get the shot to be as awesome uh-huh. as it can be. And so they're like, no, I can do it. And then they fall off a girder into like a pool, yeah. you know? If anyone's <laughs> going to make that much money, there should be like a built in stipulation that they might die. <laughs> <laughs> Like, that's what actors who get paid that much should have to do, is put their life in jeopardy on screen. Not enough billionaires have, ha, are afraid of dying at any time enough, right? Like, There's all that stuff about how, like, Tom Cruise won't stop doing his own stunts. They're like, please yeah. stop. That's like, because he's little. So, like, his center of gravity is... Have you ever <laughs> seen little kid ice skaters? Like, that's when they have to get in, is when you're little. Yeah, yeah. He's a little kid ice skater. Like that <laughs> that's why he can do his own stunts he's like a he's you know, that is correct i think that is the best if he were like large and gangly and yeah like his limbs would just be getting hit all the time and yeah <laughs> well he hurt himself in this new one and i saw oh. the trailer for it and I, there's like they show the stunt that he did where i'm just like ooh. oh the new oh, mission yeah. impossible yeah with like, is it falling off that motorcycle or it's something so, it's just they show a bunch of stuff and you just are like ooh, he went into traction for this so like it's going to be sweet. Yeah. <laughs> the first movie where Ethan falls off a motorcycle and goes, ah, fuck. Like, like, ah, that was real. I really like, they leave that, that in. more realistic. He's like a spy, whatever, in his 50s. Like, you yeah. need to see it be more realistic. Who, James Bond? Well, him too. Yeah. I think he's like 100 now, technically. James Bond has to keep doing it because he's freelance. He like he can't retire. He has like no health care. He's just like, he's been doing it for like 100 years. <laughs> like, right. <laughs> what's the? Where is the line between like we have to push the envelope to get this shot, and we just want cool, crazy stories to talk about how artistic we are on like talk oh. shows and you know like Leonardo DiCaprio in The Revenant, like every everything for months was just like. He ate nothing but like bear shit, and like and it's like he didn't need to do that. Like, but it, it promotes the movie and also makes it like seem real, and he wins the Oscar for best actor. I like, feel like yeah, when people are really traumatized, they do not want to talk about it ever yeah. again. When yeah. people like almost really die on movies, they're like they keep it a secret for ten years and then like tell it under duress because it does also happen to bring it back down all the way that like people do just die or almost die on movies sometimes so i think like leonardo dicaprio might be exaggerating and it's fine yeah but you're right the, you know, it's not like silence of the lambs was like we made the guy watch uh, terrifying footage like uh, <laughs> so get out there and see it you know they're not like it's not a funny anecdote it's like actually horrifying yeah, well, and because we know about all the Mission Impossible ones with Tom Cruise, and also he's a huge producer. Like he, I think he produces almost all those movies. So, yeah, like, like a, the a actor Tom Cruise is being put in these situations by the producer Tom Cruise. <laughs> <laughs> like, he's fine. It's his fault. Yeah. That's why we know he chose this life. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> the third mission or fourth mission impossible, he climbs the building in Dubai and like oh, he was yeah. really shooting it and there were like all these YouTube videos of people in the office taking cell phone footage and it's like really good press for the movie. So it's like speaking of Bond like with another committed actor kind of thing, uh, the movie Goldfinger. Uh, one of the most classic Bonds ever, one of the most famous characters in it, Odd Job, um, and the actor Harold Sakata was uh, like no one mentioned to him that hey don't really hit anybody and so <laughs> when in several of the takes where he hits Connery's James Bond it's just like for real and so Connery is not acting he's like ah I, I got hit by this fella like <laughs> that's just what's going on uh, and there was also a part toward the end where uh, Odd Job's death because he's like magically invincible uh, in addition to throwing hats um, there's a part where like his death is he is uh, electrocuted by bars in Fort Knox that are uh, full of current and there was an issue with the special effects when they were shooting it and so they were like actually burning his hands when he was holding the bars he didn't know you should just like pull away and they should fix it and so he just held on and got his hands burned and then later they were like oh my god that was real what? <laughs> Like, we, that was a special effect the entire time. And he was like, I don't know, we probably got it, right? Like, he was fine <laughs> with what happened to him. Permanent souvenirs. <laughs> Let's just take, like, a left turn from these kind of movies. The 40-year-old virgin, Danny, you picked out that the, uh, one of the key scenes in it is very, very real. Yeah, um, it's probably one of the most well-known scenes from that film. It's when Steve Carell is having his chest waxed. 
And the first time I saw it, I was like, there's no way that's all of his hair. Um, <laughs> and now that I'm in my 30s and have dated, I'm like, holy shit, that's his hair. <laughs> <laughs> so he actually got waxed. And I don't know if you remember, but there's a scene like where they pull it and there's like little blood. I thought that that was a packet. I thought that that was like his skin, but no, that was his blood coming through. Yeah. So <laughs> I still want to say, and over the nipple too. I want to say, yeah, they did that for real. Actually, they set up four cameras. So Judd, Judd Apatow was like, hey, we should just do it on you, like for real. And Steve Carell was like, sure. I don't think, that was like his first big film. So I don't think he was sure, going to yeah. say, you know, he was hopping from The Daily Show and I think he wasn't going to say no to, uh, to Judd Apatow. So they set up like four cameras uh, and because they couldn't go back and do it again <laughs> uh, if they messed up. And also, I guess the waxing lady didn't fully, because like where it seems like she doesn't really know what she's doing, like that was also real. <laughs> <laughs> Which if you've ever been waxed, Alex, I know. Um, I, not lately. It's very painful. Yeah. Don't let anyone tell you that. I hate when people say like, oh no, it's, it is. Those people like, don't have nerve endings or something. Like there's something <laughs> wrong with them. So I want to say okay, that yes, yeah. it was real on his chest. I've been really waxed in a different area, so I feel like I'm more of a vet than he is. But I also I'm sort of excited to learn that that was like good writing for that scene, like building up a thing of oh it's nothing, and then incredibly painful. Yeah, is like real. It turns out. Well, and Steve Carell <laughs> didn't because he's an adorable man, and men I guess don't know what it's like to be waxed, and so he didn't know it was gonna be painful. <laughs> uh, which then he later confirmed in an interview that it was extremely painful. And it's crazy uh, he could ad lib so well through all that pain. Oh yeah, he's a pro. Mm hmm. That's yeah. a great point, because like, cause so many of those, uh, especially Apatow comedies, I feel like people are like, oh, it's just they set up cameras and improvise. That's not hard. But like, he was improvising through excruciating physical torture. Like, that's amazing. Like, there were extra takes in the credits, you know? Like, that's really cool <laughs> that he could pull through. <laughs> yeah. and, f and again, like for all the movies that are need to be gritty and realistic, it's like they could have just faked that for a 40-year-old virgin, but... You know, they went to town. Okay. I thought they had. Yeah. You know, I wish they had a <laughs> right. little disclaimer like this is real. <laughs> Yeah. Because for the longest time, I really thought that, like, when I saw the blood come through, I'm like, oh, they put, like, a little patch. I know my makeup artist can do that. You know, whatever. I didn't realize that that was... Also, that his fur comes up to, like, here. It's, like, coming out of his... Yeah. His, uh, it goes up to his collarbone, which is, is, is hot. You're like, what a nice touch to add that realistic blood. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, because there's that shot after where he's just walking on the street and there's blood on his shirt. Yeah. But uh, now we know how hairy Steve Carell is. And we all win. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Another comedy, too. Uh, Danny had picked out Billy Madison as one where also they just like went for it. They just did it. Yeah, this is another one where I, you never would have known or cared in a million years that they did this for real. But the scene where he is playing dodgeball and just nailing the kids with the dodgeballs... <laughs> He's just doing that. They, they agreed to it because they like, didn't want to like, you know, CGI or rig something or whatever. And the joke is that they're getting nailed. Like it has to be, you know, it's not a joke if they're just getting them. Like he has to be nailing them. So I guess, I don't know if they told the parents exactly what was going to be happening. If it was like, they're going to be in a dodgeball scene. Uh, but yeah, he's absolutely nailing children with dodgeballs and in that scene, it's a montage, so he's just, it's just like, bam, 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 bam. Part of the cutting uh, was not just stylistic, it was also because the kids were immediately crying in pain. <laughs> so they like practically had to cut away from it. And so it's just like a montage of, you know, bam, and then ah, like kid crying, and they're like, okay, we'll cut it right there. So it's just funny, and, you know, it's just... It's so, the, so funny. Yeah. <laughs> the full-length scene would have been him hitting a kid, them crying for like 10 minutes, then him hitting the next kid. It's like, it's like the most hor secretly the most horrifying scene in any movie It's is a... 10 second montage in Billy Madison <laughs> set to the Ramones. That could be a movie too, like some kind of horror movie about nobody knows that, like they perceive a child that's actually this adult who's a nightmare, you know? It could be a full on horror movie of that too. He like doesn't know his strength. He like thinks he's a child, yeah, yeah. but he's just like 
ruining kids' faces with dodgeballs. Yeah, it's like uh, The Omen, but with bullying. You yeah. know, like it's like <laughs> it, it is kind of like The Omen that movie. I've only, I've <laughs> often compared Billy Madison to The Omen <laughs> yeah. in the third installment in like the Omen universe. This Billy Madison, <laughs> it's like. Well, I like those articles that are like, what you don't know about this movie is like this character was a ghost the whole time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which I think is like a Ferris Bueller theory mainly, where it's like. Ferris is the Fight Club imagination of Cameron. Yeah. Yeah. So just like the idea of Billy Madison is just like the children make their fear into Adam Sandler. <laughs> <laughs> if you have any stories you know about, oh, this thing on a film was super real or even just crazy things behind the scenes of a movie, anything fun like any that. Any Billy Madison fan theories, uh, come, come bring I them up. Will, we'll take them, yeah. yeah. Um, in the meantime, while people are maybe uh, lining up there, um, the movie Goodfellas whole story about it. Do you guys remember there's the scene where a couple of the good fellas are at Joe Pesci's <laughs> That's how you refer like the they all fellas. have like Letterman's jackets. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You did it. You're one of the good fellas now. <laughs> That's my favorite line from that movie. <laughs> there's a scene where they all go to Joe Pesci's mom's house to like to like get some food and chill out for a bit and she shows him a weird painting and the way Scorsese set that up is he just got his own personal mom to play Joe Pesci's mom and didn't really give her a script or anything. Uh, he told her, pretend these guys have just come home late for some food. Be sure to show them this weird painting. And then they just <laughs> made up the whole thing. The whole thing is just what Martin Scorsese's mother, Catherine, wanted to do. Yeah, yeah. it's awesome. <laughs> it's one of the best scenes in the movie. Is it great? <laughs> this dog's going Isn't that this way, every mom's dream? Way. Like, my son will become a director and then put me in a scene. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Playing a psychopath's mom. <laughs> Cause she, is she like the most uh, positive character in the entire movie? <laughs> like, is she the most likable human in all of Goodfellas? She's like, I think the she best be. fella. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She's probably, her character's murdered so many people. Yeah. We just mm -hmm. probably don't see true. it on screen. I think, I think we've got somebody lined up. If you want to tell us your name and, and then let's find out a thing. Hi, I'm Christina. Hi, Christina. Um, and so my favorite one is uh, in Lord of the Rings. I'm sure a lot of people have heard of this one. There's a scene with Viggo Mortensen, and he drops, like, uh, a helmet or, like, a sword on his foot, and they, like, pan out, and he's, like, screaming, and that's because he actually broke his toe on set, and they, oh, like, man. got it in the shot, and they're like, great, that looked good, and he, but he actually broke his toe and later had to, like, go to the doctor and get a cast and stuff. Oh. Man, I, I love that you're saying that with a smile. <laughs> <laughs> it's just such a genuine, ah, as he like screams out. I can't remember if it's the first or second Lord of the Rings movie, but it's very obvious when you rewatch it exactly which scene it is that he broke his toe. Man, that's, <laughs> that's awesome. Amazing. I'll have to check that out. I'm also surprised in a movie that has so many visual effects that they have like big heavy swords, like for real, right? Yeah. Oh, a helmet. Oh, sorry. Yeah, but still. But either like, way. Yeah, it's crazy. It's like. Yeah, because I wonder almost if like making the equipment that real is they're like a little bit hoping they get that. You know what I mean? Like so much yeah. of the movie CGI, but like maybe maybe a finger like <laughs> falls off the back of the truck. You know what I mean? Like maybe we. <laughs> Plus another one where you would never think it's real because so much in the movie is is CGI. I feel like that, what like, she was saying though, it's like you know when that pain is real. Yeah, maybe. That's true. From the scream. Because it's probably not what he would do if he was like do acting a scream. Mm. Right. Just that real pain. Yeah. And also, it's a moment you probably wouldn't put in the movie. If you, were, <laughs> you know, if you were scripting it, you wouldn't be like, now he drops his helmet on his foot. And like, he screams. Yeah. It's a nice, like, genuine moment. Cool. <laughs> what, if the, what if all the previous takes were like, ah, like he wasn't good at it at all? <laughs> they, like, uh, buttered it up. <laughs> 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 BA with a stick, just like we're gonna get him. Uh, round of applause Try. for Christina. Oh, yeah. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I, I didn't mean to cut you. No, I was just like, try it again. <laughs> <laughs> and they can't hold. Yeah. Uh, uh, next person up, name and a thing. Hey, I'm Brittany. Hi, um, Brittany. 
So uh, I, um, uh, I know this because when I was a toddler, I, my parents claim I watched like Wizard of Oz like 80 times, so I'm like that kid, but they tell me that apparently in the night, so the original Wizard of Oz in 1939 was plagued with huge production problems. So the witch like got, who originally was, I forgot her name, but um, she like fell through chap doors, got burned, all sorts of stuff, like all things are going wrong. And then like we think we, even like Judy Garland was having like costuming issues. The original Tin Man had allergic reaction to like stuff they put on him and it's just like it was just it's heralded as one of the greatest movies of all time and just like shit happened and continued to happen and it's like considered one of the most you know it's like considered one of the best films of 1939 so yeah yeah that's amazing i bet they put real lead on him yeah like yeah oh god okay he died i was way on the nose the original tin man died I think he got real sick and they had to replace him with somebody quickly. Oh, well, and I guess everybody does eventually. But I thought you were going to say there was that rumor that that there was somebody hanging in the background of the scene. Yeah, there was a rumor about that. I'm not quite sure if that's true. I think it's not true, but it's it's, very spooky to think about. Yeah, but there are a lot of shenanigans on set and just like, like, I just... I don't know, just like remember reading like a lot of the crew and stuff just like said like, yeah, things continue to go wrong the entire time of the filming, so... (laughs) It is such a like, <laughs> like, real life metaphor too, because it's like this. There's dark parts, but it's like a family movie, and like the making of it being so grinding and like depressing. Like it's so weird, right? Didn't the last Munchkin just die? Oh, I saw. I think so. I think I heard that. Yeah. R.I.P. <laughs> R.I.P. to the Munchkins. Why? Well, because I think I've also heard a rumor about the Munchkins that if you know L.A. at all, they were all put up in the Culver Hotel, which is down down the way there to the west, and apparently. It was sort of like the Olympic Villages with most Olympics. The Olympic Village, most Olympics, there's a lot of hooking up between yeah. the athletes. And apparently the munchkins in the Culver Hotel, that was what they were Dang. up to. <laughs> that was like going on. Because there's downtime, man, you know? In, in between the Tin Man, like dying of metal or whatever happened. That was so, oh boy. <laughs> Life is short. <laughs> we must oh, God. <laughs> better get together. Like, just like, yeah. <laughs> Round of applause for Brittany, guys. That was yeah, great. Thank you. Wizard of Oz. That's also, and that makes me think of uh, what I've heard about Star Wars just as a behind the scenes, not, this, not sex stuff, uh, but like that everyone making the first Star Wars movie thought it was going terribly. Like they, all, they were all kind of making fun of George Lucas throughout, like look at this nerd who doesn't know how to direct actors. And, uh, and, like, and they thought it was going to be a total flop. And Wizard of Oz, and I think I'm sure they were like, ah, this is terrible. Everybody's sexing and dying all the time. And I wonder if anybody ever thinks their movie's going well as it's being made. Well, you know? I think sometimes it goes well and then the movie's bad. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But sometimes it goes bad and then the movie's also bad, which I think is yeah. what happened with Solo. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, it's a throwback to the original. The production's <laughs> going to be plagued with problems and <laughs> people having problems directing actors. <laughs> Folks, that is the episode for this week. My thanks to Dan Hopper, Molly Lambert, and Danny Fernandez, and our audience members for all celebrating how nuts film can be. Some of those stories are dark, some of them are hilarious. All of them enrich my experience of seeing movies. And why don't you enrich your experience of this podcast by heading over to its footnotes, where you will find a wealth of cracked material Also, an article on exactly why urine does not help jellyfish stings. It's borderline useless, according to Scientific American. Plus, more updates on exactly which Oscars Suicide Squad and the Wolfman won, and some really, really classic 90s websites for the Blair Witch Project, and of course, Space Jam. And as far as this episode of the Cracked Podcast goes, our theme music is Chicago Falcon by the Budos Band. Our episode was engineered and edited by Chris Souza. Special thanks to Beth Appel, Arik Cohen, Jay Spaulding, and the whole UCB Sunset team for helping us put that live show together. And if you love this episode, oh, that's great. If you hated it, let me know about it on social media. That's right, social media. A place where I think a lot of terrible set stuff usually comes out now so maybe it publicizes that maybe that's a good thing thank you twitter for once and you can find my twitter account at alex schmitty i'm also on the wider internet at my website alex and i'm happy to say we will be back next week with more cracked podcast so how about that talk to you then.
This has been an Earwolf production. Executive produced by Scott Ackerman, Chris Bannon, and Colin Anderson. For more information and content, visit Earwolf.com. I have this book, like, laughing at me from my bookshelf. Oh, smart boy, you can't read me. Well, I can read you, Jude the Obscure. I'm Michael Ian Black, and this is Obscure, in which I read Jude the Obscure out loud and comment on it as I go. There must be literally tens of people who will go with me on this journey. Subscribe to Obscure wherever you listen.